The sword of Gryffindor, wielded by Godric Gryffindor, is 1,000 years old. Composed of silver and inlaid with rubies, it is one of the most iconic relics from the Harry Potter universe. Along with Voldemort's horcruxes, the Deathly Hollows, and other objects like the Golden Snitch or the miniature dragon figure, it is a memorable artifact which Harry comes to possess. When a worthy Gryffindor finds himself in trouble, he may pluck the sword from the sorting hat. There to serve any Gryffindor in need, it is not meant to belong to any one person. While a person may hold on to it after using it in combat, it will desert them the moment another needs it. Generally kept at Hogwarts school, under the watchful eye of the current headmaster, its main home is the school, but it can come to any Gryffindor who has the hat in an hour of need. As such, Dumbledore didn't own the sword, despite keeping it in his office. Legally, it is considered the property of the school, despite its really belonging to all Gryffindors who find themselves in trouble. As a result of this technicality, Dumbledore, in his attempt to bequeath the sword to Harry, had this part of his will rebuffed by the government. This left it to Snape to switch the sword with a fake, and deposit the real one in a lake for Harry to retrieve. However, the debate over who actually owns the sword, if anyone, doesn't end with the Ministry, or even the Gryffindors. Before we continue, I'm Riley and this is Otherworldly Fiction. On this channel, I rant about books, study characters, share lore, and offer writing advice. If any of this sounds like your cup of basilisk blood, hit that subscribe button. Posts are on Fridays. The Sword of Gryffindor is 1,000 years old and was crafted by a goblin king. A king because he was the most skilled at his craft as a silversmith, Ragnarok I created the sword. He then gave it to Gryffindor in exchange for payment, having been commissioned by the founder to make it. But Ragnarok was possessive. Jealous of Gryffindor's owning the sword, he spread a report that Godric had stolen it from him. This was a lie, but many goblins believed it. And in the thousand years which passed, the lie and the truth only became further conflated. With all wizards who kept the sword painted as thieves, a precedent was set for the goblin community to be resentful towards Gryffindor and anyone else who claimed ownership of the sword. Their belief in Gryffindor's guilt was furthered by a unique belief in goblin culture. An object belongs, in their mind, to the person who made it. They are extremely proud of their work. All of their creations are made of silver, with the sword having those attributes which make a goblin work special. The sword can absorb anything, such as poisons or venoms, which will make it more powerful. As a result, it's coming into contact with Basculus blood, which is deadly to horcruxes, makes it as capable as one of the fangs of destroying these horrific objects. Humans view transactions differently from goblins. When a human purchases an object, they believe it is theirs to keep indefinitely, unless it is stated otherwise. When a person dies, they expect to pass the object on to their descendants. A piece of silver, such as an accessory or jewelry, would then be expected to become a family heirloom. However, goblin-made heirlooms always engender anger from the goblin community, because they see goblin-made objects as belonging to their group first and foremost. When an object is exchanged with a wizard for gold, they view the human who bought the item as a temporary owner. Until they die, they are, according to goblin tradition, only renting the item. Unfortunately for the goblins, this is a custom few wizards are familiar with. Fleur can't escape a skull from Griphook when it's found out that her family has a goblin-made tiara which has been in the family for several generations. Griphook, on being rescued by Harry, also feels he is entitled to the Sword of Gryffindor, creating a debate for Harry. Neither the human or the goblin beliefs are wrong, but the differences in thinking between the two cultures creates a clash with no simple compromise in sight. Ragnarok, desperate to reclaim the treasure he'd made, sent his followers to steal the sword. Gryffindor, though, defeated them. While he didn't kill them, he sent them back to their leader with a warning. He'd be perfectly willing to fight them if Ragnarok pushed the matter. 
but the bitter king dropped the issue. Furious, Rugnock eventually passed away, still nursing his grudge. The Sword of Gryffindor is also the result of a bygone age. Crafted in the medieval ages, it wasn't just for show. It was used as a true weapon, and Godric wasn't the only wizard to carry a sword. With no laws yet established, just separate wizards from muggles, the two groups mingled. Wizards, especially in a superstitious time, had to learn to blend in. Living amongst muggles and avoiding accusations of witchcraft, they were as skilled as any muggle when it came to everyday skills. Therefore, many wizards learned to duel, and Godric was one of the best. Wizards could use their wands in a duel, but this was frowned upon. Some would cheat, but most wizards considered it unfair or dishonorable to take advantage of a muggle in this way. This meant that, at least among fair-minded wizards, contests between wizards and muggles, as far as sword fights went, were even and occurred often. Finally, Gryffindor's sword doesn't simply appear to those who need it. It offers itself to those who deserve it, who are worthy of wielding it. In this respect, the author has stated that she was inspired by the legendary Excalibur when designing the sword. Of King Arthur legend, the sword Excalibur only offers itself to one who deserves it, in this case Arthur. Others try to claim it, but Arthur remains the rightful owner. Eventually, he has to let the sword go. When he dies, rather than the sword being passed to his descendants, it is returned to where he found it. It goes back to the lake from which it was retrieved, mirroring the goblin belief of an item being returned on the user's passing. Moreover, Rowling, in discussing the sword, noted that myths and folklore are rife with enchanted swords, citing the Tua de Danon sword, Nuadu, as an example. Nuadu comes from Celtic mythology, but there are other swords still. When Harry reclaims the sword in the seventh book, how he does so also has significance. When Arthur found Excalibur, it was in a lake, given to him by another, by the Lady of the Lake, he was deemed worthy of keeping it. Likewise, Harry, being gifted the sword by someone else, collects the sword of Gryffindor from a lake. Of course, while the metaphor is intentional on the author's part, she adds that Snape's motivation for placing the sword there is petty. Snape wants to help Harry, but he's still resentful enough towards him that he doesn't want to make it easy. As a result, Harry is made to freeze his butt off in order to collect his prize. In conclusion, of all objects in the Harry Potter universe, the Sword of Gryffindor is one of the more intriguing. Recalling myth, but still unique in its own right, it remains an iconic part of the Potter universe, capable of destroying horcruxes, connected to the Sorting Hat, and ready to offer itself to any worthy Gryffindor in need, it is a remarkable treasure. As a member of Gryffindor House myself, I am happy for the privilege of our house possessing this treasure. Who knows, the sword might just help me the next time a bear chases me through the woods. Yeah, that actually happened to me. Which Hogwarts house are you in? What is your favorite object from the wizarding world and why? Let me know in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, like and subscribe. Thank you for watching and happy reading.